Today, an Australian United Nations observer among those injured in a strike in southern Lebanon. Young people express concerns over the Alice Springs curfew as police step up efforts to spread awareness. Plus, church and meals for the homeless services across the country as millions mark Easter Sunday. Inferno, Sebastian and Tim Zhu's undefeated run comes to an end in a bloody fight against Sebastian Fondora. Hello and welcome to ABC News, I'm Dan Borsher. The Australian government has confirmed an Australian Defence Force member has been injured in a blast in Lebanon. Political reporter Monty Vogel has been following the story. Well, we know that this strike occurred in the southern part of Lebanon near the border with Israel. We know that this has been a particular flashpoint in recent months. We've seen Israel trading fire with armed group Hezbollah uh, since the war in Gaza broke out. Now, we knew an Australian was injured in this strike, uh, but we have now had it confirmed from Australia's Department of Defence that it was one of their members, an Australian... Australia's contribution to the United Nations. They were undertaking a routine patrol uh, to monitor, act monitor activity near the border with Israel. Now, they were accompanied by uh, three United Nations military officers, uh, observers and uh, uh, an interpreter. Uh, they were also all injured. We have heard from the United Nations about this strike as well. Here's a little of what they had to say. We have launched uh, an investigation to uh, look into this incident and into the explosions. I know that there are a lot of speculations at the moment, but uh, in relation to what we do as an organization, we need to verify the information through our own investigation. So I hope we will be able to find out more shortly. Now, the Australian who was injured uh, received non-life-threatening injuries. They were transported to a health uh, centre at a nearby military base uh, where they received treatment and they've now been released to recover. We know that the Department of Defence uh, has said that, that it's undertaking appropriate steps to ensure the safety and welfare of its member. Now, we've also heard from the Israeli military and they say that they weren't involved in the attack. Monty Povel reporting from Parliament House in Canberra. And it comes as an aid ship carrying food to Gaza sets sail from a port in Cyprus. The shipment is the second to be sent through a maritime corridor after Israeli restrictions meant that little aid could be sent by land to northern Gaza. Aid agencies continue to warn that civilians are on the brink of famine. Aid drops into Gaza are expensive, inefficient and increasingly controversial. These ready-prepared meals from the U.S. Army are being flown more than a 1,000 miles from a U.S. airbase in Qatar. There's plenty of food, just a short drive from Gaza's borders, but this American aid is being flown right across the Middle East. 80 crates of food on board two C-17 transport planes dropped into a population the U.N. says is on the brink of famine. It's not perfect. We know that there's upwards of 2 million people who need food on the ground who are hungry, innocent civilians who didn't ask for this conflict. And we're dropping meals in the tens of thousands, but at least it's something. So does it feel like a drop in the bucket? Maybe a little bit. But if you're a family on the ground who got some of this aid, it can be a lifesaver. 12 people were reported to have drowned this week trying to retrieve packages from the sea. Six others crushed in a stampede. What are you doing to try and mitigate those risks? Literally everything we can. So I know you spoke with the colonel earlier. We use a chute that falls at a slower rate to give the Gazans more time to see the parachutes and make sure that they're out of the way. We also have assets overhead that clear the drop zone, so we will not drop if there's any sort of groupings of people there. After three hours in the air, the ramp opens on Gaza's devastated coastline. They're just over the hatch, ready to release the aid down into Gaza. There's no organised distribution system down there. There it goes. A drop of aid in an ocean of hunger. Getting aid in this way is a last resort, 
but a growing number of countries are doing it. How much do these eye-catching flights relieve pressure on Gaza's civilians and how much the pressure on governments elsewhere? It's been five days since a 14-day youth curfew was announced for Alice Springs in the wake of violent incidents across the town. The community continues to have mixed reactions to the curfew, which bars young people aged under 18 from entering the Outback Town CBD at night. Charmaine Allison has more from Alice Springs. We're hearing it's been another quiet night in Alice Springs when it comes to this curfew. Police say there were no significant criminal incidents overnight and no arrests were made in relation to any breaches of curfew. However, police said bottle shops did reopen yesterday after being closed on Good Friday and they saw last night a spike in domestic violence incidents, which they believe are linked to these liquor outlets reopening. And it's raised concerns that many young people in Alice Springs don't have a safe place to go home to as a part of this curfew. But overall, police say they're still heartened by how the curfew is going and they believe it's making a difference when it comes to crime and antisocial behaviour in the outback town. Charmaine, it's young people who are at the centre of this curfew. How are they feeling? Yes, we've heard a range of emotions from young people in the town when it comes to this curfew. Some say they believe it makes them feel safer in the CBD at night, but others say it's left them feeling disillusioned. Uh, we've also heard that many young people in town actually aren't aware that there is a curfew in place, uh, especially those who don't speak English as a first language. Now, police have said they're making concerted efforts to address this. They're producing more information in language and are travelling into communities alongside Aboriginal liaison officers to actually speak to young people on the ground about what this curfew means for them. But there are concerns that many are still unaware. We also spoke to 18-year-old local Armani Francois who was in the CBD this week when she was stopped by police. She was accompanying her younger cousins through the town and she says the interaction with police was intimidating. She also said the curfew is inconvenient for many young people and doesn't go far enough in addressing the complex issues behind youth crime in the region. Here's a bit of what she had to say. I think it's definitely, definitely achieving um, quite good statistics with children off street, but I think it's very temporary again. It's another temporary fix and it's, it's a band-aid effect on a wound that's a lot deeper. Armani isn't alone in her concerns. Many community le leaders have expressed worries this week that not enough is being done to address the long-term issues behind crime and antisocial behaviour in the region. These issues include domestic violence, inadequate housing, addiction and, of course, entrenched poverty and neglect of remote Aboriginal communities. Leaders say until these issues are properly addressed, we won't see lasting change in Alice Springs. Millions of Australians are gathering to celebrate Easter Sunday. <laughs> Congregations have been gathering at services across the country to mark the day Christians believe Jesus rose from the dead. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has urged those travelling this Easter weekend to take care and thanked those who are working through the long weekend. Celebrations and services across the country remind us of the importance of forgiveness, grace and kindness to those in need. Qualities that are so much a part of the compassion and virtue of this, the greatest country on earth. In Sydney, the Bill Cruz Foundation has held an Easter lunch for those experiencing homelessness and those struggling with the cost of living. Reverend Bill Cruz says Australians need to rally around each other. It's time for us all to get out of our high horses and just say hello to one another and treat one another with a bit of respect, love and compassion. Because the message of Easter is all about lovingness and compassion and reaching out to one another. Meanwhile, at the Vatican, Pope Francis has presided over the midnight Easter service at St Peter's Basilica, easing concerns about his health. The 87-year-old pontiff sent a scare through the Catholic Church when he made a last-minute decision to skip his usual participation in the Good Friday procession at the Colosseum. 
A land, sea and air search and rescue operation has resumed for a fisherman swept out to sea on West Australia's south coast. Police received reports that the man had been swept off rocks in Esperance, which is about 700 kilometres southeast of Perth. The incident happened about half past two yesterday afternoon. An initial recovery effort was launched by authorities but abandoned late in the day. Indigenous football great Eddie Betts has vowed to continue to speak out against racism as police search for the man responsible for yelling racial slurs outside his home. Betts posted security camera vision to social media showing a man driving past his home in Melbourne while shouting racial slurs at the children on Thursday. To see that someone actually got out of their car and at 8.40 at night to, to drive to my house and yell abuse at, at my kids over the fence. I think this one hits a lot harder than all the, the racial uh, abuse that I've had over my years. This continues to happen to, to Aboriginal people um, all over the country and we've just got to keep calling it out. Overseas, one of the largest telecommunications companies in the United States, AT&T, says the personal data of millions of customers have been leaked onto the dark web. Around 7.5 million account holders and over 65 million former customers' personal information, including social security numbers, were leaked. The tech giant conducted a mass reset of passcodes to all active customers. In a statement, AT&T said they have no evidence of unauthorised access to its systems causing the leak. Authorities have begun repair work on a bridge in the US city of Baltimore days after it collapsed following a ship collision. Teams of engineers are working to cut and lift sections of steel from the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Maryland. Officials say the operation is complicated by the need to remove debris without spilling hazardous material from shipping containers. Seven floating cranes, including one capable of lift lifting 1,000 tonnes, are on site in the water. A warning, this next report contains the name and image of an Indigenous person who has died. It appears a historical mystery may have been solved. A family has come forward identifying a puzzling set of photographs showing First Nations people living overseas more than 150 years ago. The photos were the first visual evidence of people migrating from the Australian continent prior to British colonisation. An investigation by the ABC's Compass program has uncovered a network of families in both Arnhem Land and Indonesia hoping to reconnect with long-lost relatives. The Wudamapa family was enjoying quiet time at home at Groot Island on Australia's far north coast when they saw something that shocked them. My cousin, he rang me and he goes, guess what? I've seen some photos on ABC. They're our ancestors. That's our family, that's Jurukaya. I just couldn't stop smiling like, really? The photos were taken in a studio in the Indonesian city of Makassar in 1873. They corroborate written accounts of Indigenous people travelling to Asia long before British colonisation of their country, sailing away with the Asian fishing crews who were visiting the northern coast for hundreds of years. The family can't be 100% sure. Your ancestor has scars on his skin. But they are convinced that it is their great-grandfather Jirakai in the photos due to the scarification, physical resemblance and oral history. They lived overseas. They travelled overseas before the non-Indigenous people came to us. It's like a love story. Jirakai went to Indonesia. He had a wife and children. They're now trying to locate Jirakai's descendants. Helping them in Indonesia is Lynette Russell, who's heading an international research project investigating early contacts on the Australian continent. It's extremely likely that there are descendants of Aboriginal people here in Makassar, and it is extremely likely that there are descendants of Makassan sailors in Australia. Hello. Hello. How are you? And in the port city, Professor Russell is discovering local families trying to locate their relatives in Australia. Gaharad and Lewa's great-grandfather was a fishing captain who's believed to have had an Aboriginal wife and children during his decades visiting Arnhem Land in the 19th century. I really want to meet them. The most important thing is to meet them and complete the family tree with my Aboriginal family. 
What's remarkable about Pak Kahar's family is that what they're saying is almost identical to what the families in Northern Australia are saying, which is that they know they have relatives overseas. They're desperate to connect with them. But there is urgency to this because with every generation, the knowledge and the memories of what occurred is being lost. I want to make that journey over there and meet these people, see what I can find. For now, the Wudamapa family, proud their ancestor, is helping shed light on a little-known part of history. Aaron Park, ABC News, Groot Island. Marine heat waves cause severe environmental damage, take a heavy toll on marine life and can have knock-on economic consequences. Now scientists are deploying smart buoys along the West Australian coast in the hope of better predicting hot water events. Creating a new data set from the ocean, eight of these wave and temperature sensing devices have been moored along a 2,000 kilometre stretch of ocean from north of Broome to Durian Bay. The smart boys measure the temperature on the surface, in the water column and on the ocean floor and report in real time. They've got a satellite uh, transponder in the top, so that constantly pings and all the data is live on the website. They're part of UN-endorsed international research, which aims to use forecasts from the Bureau of Meteorology to create localised marine temperature predictions. Coastal regions are really where we've got a lot of our productivity occurring, so a lot of our fisheries, a lot of the habitats that we love, like our coral reefs, our seagrass meadows, are all sitting in those coastal regions, and yet the predictions that we are working with right now are very much large scale. In 2011, ocean temperatures along the WA coast soared by four to five degrees above average, wiping out kelp forests, bleaching coral and killing a raft of marine life. Earlier this month, 200-year-old corals in Queensland were bleached in hot water. Experts say marine heat waves will become more frequent and an improved warning system could help coastal and fishery management. If there was a rehabilitation project that was being set up to say, for example, restore a seagrass environment or a coral reef environment, then you wouldn't choose to do that at a time when uh, there was going to be a large uh, marine heat wave event. The project will run over four years. If successful, it could create a forecasting model for other coastal regions around the world. Joe Prendergast, ABC News, Dongra. He's a Netflix star and a powerhouse of the Northern Territory tourism industry with various multi-million dollar ventures across the top end. But after Outback Wrangler, Matt Wright faced the crash death of his former co-star, some of his high-profile deals have been put on hold. For this special report, Matt Garrick investigates what it could mean for the Matt Wright brand and for the companies that have backed him along the way. The wildest frontiers on earth. The face of a multi-million dollar tourism empire and a man used to the flashing lights of fame. Working with Crocs is in my blood. It is the image of a little bit of wild country. It's not the wild west, it's the wild top end. And, um, and he's the Outback Wrangler. She'll come back in a minute. She hasn't gone far. Hop back. She's coming. Right. Although he grew up in South Australia and Queensland, Matt Wright came to prominence in the top end, thanks to his adventurous TV shows like The Outback Wrangler and Netflix's popular Wild Croc Territory. I'm Matt Wright. Alongside his television career, Mr Wright has put his stamp across the territory's lucrative tourism market. Trying to get some work done. He owns several tourism businesses and uh, from accommodations like safari camps, island retreats, um, um, some corporate events, adventure events, organisation, helicopter tours and boat tours. Has everyone turned against you, Mr Wright? But that empire currently hangs in the balance. Mr Wright is facing criminal charges in the NT's local and Supreme Courts. Allegations he attempted to pervert the course of justice following the 2022 chopper crash death of his Netflix co-star, Chris Willow Wilson. 
Matt Wright strenuously denies these charges and will be defending them. Since Mr Wilson's death, high-profile partnerships have been put on hold. Tourism Australia confirming Matt Wright's been dropped from its so-called Friends of Australia program, a spokesman telling the ABC... Tourism Australia does not have any current activity or arrangements in place with Matt Wright. The pause button also hit on partnerships with beer and clothing companies. The main outlier, streaming giant Netflix, continues to stream Wild Croc territory, despite a reported plea to stop by Mr Wilson's widow. If Netflix would continue with showing it, airing it, um, well, everyone probably will say, well, it was their investment, it's their, their profit. Netflix wouldn't comment, saying only that the show remained live on its platform. Tourism operator Mick Dennigan knows well the feeling of building a brand in the top end and what can happen when it's threatened to be taken away at whip-cracking speed. Life is ups and downs, you know, the only thing that varies is the depth. Mr Dennigan made headlines after he shot an axe-wielding home invader in 2017, an incident from which he was eventually cleared of wrongdoing. I was just lucky I had a shotgun there and had the uh, brains not to blow his head off, to shoot him in the leg instead. OK, so we've got um, Chug here. He's only about a 14-foot male crocodile. But he, he believes the future of Matt Wright's brand area. and businesses will be largely dependent on the outcome of the court cases and how he rebuilds from there. No matter who you are, whether you're a resort or whether you're an individual person or a tour guide or a fishing operator, we're all out there um, polishing our trademarks and sometimes if they get tarnished, then you just got to get another tin of Brasso and uh, clean it up, you know. But whatever the verdicts, the future of Mr Wright's businesses and his role in them, after the matters are finalised, looks to be somewhat up in the air. A search of Mr Wright's businesses shows that in mid-2022, just months after the crash that killed Mr Wilson, six of his businesses under parent company Wright Expeditions were folded. With his outback airboat adventures, the last under that company name still afloat. Mr Wright declined an interview for this story. There won't be any more comments. There hasn't been comments. Let the courts do their thing. Mr Wright returns to Darwin local court to face further charges in June, with a Supreme Court trial likely to be held later this year. Matt Garrick, ABC News, Darwin. Tim Zhu's undefeated record in professional boxing has come to an end, losing his world title bout by split decision to American Sebastian Fundora in Las Vegas. The towering inferno, Sebastian Fundora! Zhu started strong, but an inadvertent elbow from Fundora opened up a deep cut on his head. As the match went on, six foot six Fundora dominated as Zoo's cunt turned the title bout into a 12 round bloodbath. The split decision result sees Zoo hand over the WBO title, Super Welterweight, and vacant WBC titles to Fundora. The momentum was rolling, uh, swinging hard in the first, first rounds, first two rounds, and then boom, you're, you're blinded completely. So, look, this is boxing, this is part of the sport, and, and this thing happens. Uh, Congratulations to Fondora, he's the, he's the new king at the 154. In the Super Rugby Pacific competition, the ACT Brumbries have narrowly held on to claim a one-point victory over the Queensland Reds in Brisbane. After trading tries, a long-range penalty kick was all that separated the top Australian teams in the first half. The opening 40 minutes were overshadowed by a horrific leg injury to Brumbies hooker Lachlan Lonigan, who will miss the rest of the season season with a fractured ankle. The Reds scored back-to-back -back tries to start the second half, jumping to a nine-point lead. But the Canberra side responded with another individual effort from Tom Wright. Noah Lolosio kicking some game proved the difference as the Brumbies held on to claim the 20 to 19-point win in front of all, almost 18,000 fans. A Queensland skateboard prodigy is on track to become one of the country's youngest Olympians, equipped with tricks no one else in the world can do. Most of Australia's skateboarding hopefuls are under 18, with competitors drawing their inspiration from the sport's debut at the Tokyo Games. <laughs> 
Arissa True was nine when she set her sights on becoming an Olympian, inspired by the skateboarding from the Tokyo Olympics. Watching it, I was like, I really want to be there. I just want to do that so much. Now, the Gold Coast 13-year-old is on track to becoming one of Australia's youngest competitors. My ultimate goal for the Olympics is a gold medal or a podium, so I'm hoping I can do that, but I just have to train really hard. And if she does, it would break a 68-year-old record. Sandra Morgan finishing well. Sandra Morgan was 14 when she won gold. Australia winning. Only the top 20 skaters in the world get to qualify to compete in Paris. But given Arissa became the first female ever to land a 720 last year... Coach Trevor Ward is confident she's going. Something drastic would have to happen for her not to uh, make it to the next, uh, to the Olympics. Most of Australia's Olympic hopefuls vying for a spot in this year's Games are under 18. It's a trend that's changed in the past few decades. Athletes have two more international competitions to go for a spot in Paris in July. <laughs> Fellow Gold Coaster Chloe Cavell is also set to wear the green and gold. I'm feeling pretty confident because I'm in a good place. It's a pinch me moment for the 14 year old. Yeah, when I was a kid and started to do skating and got better and better, I definitely did hope to go to the Olympics one day and now that my dream could come true, it's super amazing and exciting to think about. Both skaters coming full circle to inspire the sport's next generation. Jessica Lamb, ABC News, Gold Coast. On the satellite, heavy cloud is bringing showers to the Queensland coast, northern New South Wales and south of Western Australia. On the synoptic, moist, unstable winds are causing possible thunderstorms in the north of the country, western New South Wales and Victoria. A high will keep elsewhere dry. Looking around the country for tomorrow, widespread showers across Queensland, clearing in the southwest, mostly sunny and warm in the northeast. To New South Wales and the ACT, mostly sunny in the north, fog clearing in the southeast and a late shower in the southwest. For Victoria, rain in the southwest, mostly cloudy in the southeast and a late shower in the north. For Tasmania, mostly cloudy and mild in the south, evening rain for the north. To South Australia, strong winds in the west, mostly cloudy in the north, showers elsewhere. For Western Australia, storms in the northeast, sunny in the northwest and mostly clear in the south. And in the Northern Territory, isolated showers in the northwest, the chance of a storm over the Arnhem district, mostly sunny over the interior and clearing fog in the south. Looking ahead to Tuesday's forecast for the capital cities, possible showers for Brisbane and Sydney, clearing rain for Canberra and Adelaide, showers in Melbourne and Hobart, sunny for Perth, possible thunderstorms for Darwin with a top of 33. And that's the latest for the ABC Newsroom.